Alex Beaujard, creative director and MD of Lancering, even has a bougie name to match his bougie career. Alex is our first naval architect on the Designer Arty podcast. He has a master's degree in industrial design and a prestigious career, including designing furniture for the Lindley brand and has received numerous awards in the over £150,000 contemporary luxury kitchen design category. Who is the Beaujard, the man born to design in the bougie design space with the belief there's a valuable relationship born when we find the pleasure in designing products? Welcome to the Designer Arty Podcast. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. And I was a little bit late and you're very patient. I appreciate that. And you're a busy man. I was early as well. So, you know, you've always got to be here. I'm always early for things. Are you? I'm terrible at spelling, but always early. Do you appreciate, do you value people's time? Why are you early? People pleaser? No, I, like I, I, so I like get really anxious on in journeys. I just want to get there quickly. Interesting. So you're managing your emotions by arriving. Totally. Properly. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Icebreaker. Yeah. Tell the Designer Arty podcast audience something about you that they wouldn't necessarily associate with. Oh. Alex Bo- Bogard. 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 It's a soft G. It's a soft G. What um, does it mean? What does Bogard mean? It, 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 it's, it's old Norman French for beautiful goose. Beautiful goose. Yeah, totally. The finest of all of the fowl. Interesting, which is an interesting surname for someone with such a bougie career. Beautiful goose. Um, thanks, I think. Golden Goose. Is bougie a compliment or a, an insult? Definitely a compliment from okay. me, but some people I'll might be insult, might use it as an insult. Tell me, what's your icebreaker? I, I bought, I bought a picture. I bought, I didn't bring it in because it wouldn't fit in the lift. But I bought a picture of my bicycle. And why um, is that? Why is that interesting? Well, um, or unusual. So, it's it's just it's just the most beautiful thing. It's the most beautiful thing in the world. Can I think. we look? I've got I've got a picture of it on my on my computer. Um, just give me a moment. So, so you consider this to be a beautiful thing? I, I, I do. Yeah, I do for for a number of reasons. Um, I, I've, I've become a huge lover of cycling since since my mid twenties. Um, here, here we are. Interesting. So, so I bought this from from it's a it's a single speed bicycle. I bought it from a man in um, who lived on a hill who couldn't who couldn't go up the hill. Uh, because it's a single speed bike and it's just an uh, an absolutely beautiful little thing and then i i built the kind of little bits of timber and and stitched the leather on the handlebars myself to just have this 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 exquisite kind of show pony of a, of a bicycle that is uh i just i absolutely love it so for anybody not watching this on video this is what, is it a carbon fiber no it's it's uh it's it's a steel single speed track bike steel and then you've created this beautiful leather yeah so um I, there's this company in america that they've got like a they've got a dairy farm and they make leather products for bikes and they they hand make them in the farm so i found these guys online and they sent me all these various bits of leather and then i hand stitched the, the handlebars you hand stitched them yeah which is extraordinary because i'm i'm not a i'm not a practical man in any way but i, I was so I, I'm just I, I love bicycles so much that I wanted to to have this 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 beautiful this beautiful thing. So I hand stitched those and and then um, yeah, just it's 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 a very lovely thing. What an exquisite, unique piece! And yeah. this is something you drive around London happily. So I cycle around London. I, I do. I've 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 recently changed to a Brompton um, because it's easier to put in the back of the car when I when I drive in. But but yeah, I've just I've never really been a car enthusiast, but. Uh, when I started cycling in my in my mid twenties, I just I've always I've always loved both the machine of the bicycle, but also like the ro- like a, the role of cycling in my life. I, I just love it. So that's my icebreaker. Do you surround yourself with beautiful items? No, like I, I wish I could, but I. I uh, so what I was going to say is I wish I could, but I have a family. Obviously, they're beautiful items, and I love surrounding myself with them. But um, you know, the the practicalities of life often often give way and um like my, my wife's a mathematician so she's a very a very practical person and sometimes sometimes things that that follow like quite strict like for a strict aesthetic design language can be a bit less practical so so i would say our main marital battleground over the last 20 years has been um the prioritization of really lovely stuff 
instead of really useful stuff. And sometimes there's some really lovely stuff that's really useful, but um, less than I'd like. <laughs> but your bike is exquisite. Yeah, that's my territory. I can I can have something I can completely control and not 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 be told it's impractical. Although it is quite quite an impractical bicycle because it hasn't got any gears. Wait, really? Well, it has one. It has one. Going up hills is tricky. Wait till your children want to use your bicycle. I just don't know how I how I deal with that emotion. I don't I don't know where I am with it. Would I that think. be a struggle? I, yeah, it, they're not really. No, don't touch. They're not those things. Yeah, I live in a house with 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 a guy that likes white clean order. Oh really? And I have an eleven year old, and he really struggles. Yeah, yeah. with yeah. sticky marks. Yeah. Um, moving items, yeah. colouring anything plastic. Yeah. 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 No look. Interesting. I, Good luck with that. Yeah, it's it's just you know, I, I suppose it. It, like I'm, I'm seeing it as a way to learn more about myself, having alternative perspectives. <laughs> Ooh, love talking about that. Right, let, let's let's first start with your training then. So you you qualified as a naval architect. Yeah, first I on did. the Design Authority podcast. What does that What does that mean? Well, you know, so so I I, I grew up in in the Channel Islands, um, and it wasn't unusual for. You, when you're surrounded by boats, and and I taught sailing, and I just loved sailing. Um, to want to then design boats because they, they're kind of the biggest thing in your life. Um, and my grandfather was an artist and, and he taught me to draw and I, I kind of loved the principle of designing. And then when I did a degree in naval architecture, and I have to say it, it's, it's, an, it's an exceptional discipline and it's, it's, very, it's really hard because it's an engineering degree. And so it's all mathematics and structural calculations and um, fluid engineering and... And I was all, I was awful at it. <laughs> was yeah, you're, it's interesting because your eyes have just glazed over when you're talking about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of it's. Te- I was just terrible at it. And in, in the, it, <laughs> it, but but whenever I wrote like a, an essay or did a, a, a um, like some maths problem that I had to solve, I'd always draw nice diagrams. And, and one of my lecturers in the in the, my my final term of my final year said, "There's this thing, there's this thing called industrial design, right? And um and you should um, it's it you can only do it." if you've got a background in engineering, but it's for people who are creative, who, you know, let's be honest, you're, you're, you're pretty awful at, 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 at naval art. And he was right, I was pretty awful at it. So, so he kind of, you know, that was a bit of a, a lightning strike moment where I suddenly realized there was another way. Um, and um, I did, I did a, a master's in industrial design a couple of years later and it was just a, a total life changing kind of thing. It was amazing. Fabulous. So, so how long was your initial degree? Your naval architecture degree. It was four years of, of kind of mathematical torment, <laughs> and and that's a, a challenge, I guess, for some students, some some, some youngsters who are thinking about embarking on a career in design, just deciding which act- which course, which degree is actually right for them. Yeah, right. I mean, I completely agree. You know, how 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 do you know? And like, you could be you could be like an amazing designer and just be you know. You could just be in the wrong discipline, and that's precisely where I was. Well, how but do I you know? Hopefully, I'm okay at design, but um, but but I don't. I I I've I don't heard think, you're okay now. I don't think you can know until you try stuff, and but I don't think it's such a bad thing from an employer perspective to see that somebody's tried something and then moved on to something else because it's better that than you labour your entire career at something that you were never really cut out for, right? So 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 I I. I I think you've just got to go with your heart and what you seem to be good at. Because um, that could have been an option for you, I yeah, guess. Yeah. You could have, st- if it wasn't for that lecturer who suggested to you that you are quite creative and to go yeah. onto the industrial design master's course, yeah. you could have pursued a career in naval architecture. Yeah, it would have been, a, like, lives would have been at risk. Boats would have, <laughs> boats would have sunk. sunk. Yeah, it had, had I been responsible for that side of things. So, um, so let's just, you know, let's thank... Stuart Roy, where, wherever he is, for uh, for for po- po- poking me in the right direction, um, because it, yeah, I, it just wasn't it wasn't who I was. What about the benefit of experience? Have you got anything to share for anybody considering which which design course to embark on? Um, I, I think that's really difficult, right? Because everyone's situation is so difficult, different. And different. Forgive me, different. But one one of the observations we've seen, and within the business we run at the moment, Lancering. Um, there's like a clear delineation between people who are kind of naturally technocratic and people who are naturally creative. Um, and there are all these different 
metaphors for it. So it's that people think with one side of the brain dominant or mm. the other, or that people, you know, have a, a natural set of skills that that, that lean in one way or, or another way. Um, and I think you get in the design world, you get creative people who probably they really excel at creative, and then you don't really want them in charge of the technical detail. And I think you get technical people who really excel at detail and crossing T's and dotting I's and, and coming up with creative solutions in the technical space, but don't really bring as much value in the, in the creative space. Um, and a really great business model is where you, you identify this and you have the two arms working together if, if you can, and you're able to achieve really special work together. Um, the most important lesson I'd say is to identify your key strengths early and don't try and pretend to be something you aren't. Oh, um, that's a good one. Identify your key strengths early and don't try to pretend something that you aren't. Yeah. So I think I, when looking back when I did engineering um, is because, you know, I was from a very creative family and it was a, like it was the like the the most stupid form of rebellion I could come up with was to think, well, you know, I'll go and do something really, really technical. I mean, why didn't I just like get a pair of DMs or get a tattoo or something? I, did, I just I decided a really difficult degree, and um, and actually, you know, I was of create create creative stock, not not technical stock. So that's a conclusion I have I've subsequently come to when you know when you start doing the the, the area that I think you may be more comfortable in, and and doors start opening, and and you know you you're awake you're waking up early in the morning, so you're excited about doing that kind of work instead of waking up dreading doing that kind of work so um I think and isn't yes. that a gift when you when you muster up the courage to actually be honest and say actually this isn't really working for me and to make that transition from something you loathe to something you love well you, but you don't even know you're going to love i mean you hope you're going to love it right but i think just saying you know I, this isn't right i think that's a it shows a lot of strength of character doesn't it and, and failure is okay for you <laughs> uh yeah it's, it kind of had to be right i think i think it does have to be because um Gosh, there are there are a, a thousand really hackneyed phrases about this, but but um, I've 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 been really lucky, o, o, you know, o, over the first I'd say the first half of my career because I'm I'm still going because um, I've I've had an opportunity to try lots of things and, and work in lots of different cultures, um, and yeah, you know, I've kind of buggered a lot of stuff up and and um, and and I had some successes, and I don't think it, it's possible to really um, do new stuff without challenging yourself to a point where sometimes you you've overstretched or you've got it wrong or you you were overconfident or underconfident it I, I think it's a really important part of um growth and I don't, I don't think it's such a bad thing if you're if you're if, if you're kind of openly a, bit, a bit, bit vulnerable about that because people around you they're not you know they sometimes have your back <laughs> they, they try and yeah. help you develop they kind of you know they kind of help 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 you work through these things so yeah, yeah I, think that's I like really the important. association with growth trying new things encourages growth yeah it encourages new ways of behaving new ways of doing well you know when I was 18 I'd never left Guernsey so we used to go on holiday to an island called Herm which is three square miles to get away from the metropolis of of Guernsey so when I first came to England I I, I was naive and I, I didn't know anyone or anything at all. And I, I just don't think you can really embrace that 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 kind of, you know, all of the challenges that come at you without without kind of, you know, dashing your ship against some of the rocks of the tricky bits and, and then kind of navigating your way through the, um, you know, the, the, the carbon waters. I don't know if the, the, the sailing metaphors maybe have been pulled a little bit too far there at the end, but, but I, I think I, it's really important. I like important. them. I like them. I like the, the nod to the navel. Nice. Yeah, yeah. Hey there, if you're enjoying this episode and want to hear more exciting and informative chats about design and architecture, then don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'd love to hear from you. Anyway, back to the episode. Industrial um, industrial design then, so you did your master's. Yeah. How, why did you love that? So do you know what it is? Yeah, designing products. Well, I thought that as well, but it's not right. It Like it... So I, I was like struggling for a, um, an elevator pitch definition of what industrial design is. And when you look back at the amazing industrial designers who who were like huge inspirations to me, people like Raymond Lowy, who designed the Shell logo or the, the you know, the, the inside of the space shuttle or, or the Greyhound bus, you know, 
when 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 is it a product? When is it a vehicle? When is it an interior? So I, I was I was kind of briefed on this by by my lecturers, and and ultimately the, the the kind of the craft of industrial design is 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 designing pleasure into products, and and that's as much understanding people's emotional needs as it is Ooh. the physical needs. Designing pleasure into products. Yeah, yeah. So um, and that that's like profound in, in many ways because then you understand how the role of industrial design could be around medical products or ease of use for people who have different needs or you know to design super luxury stuff which i've been really really lucky to have an opportunity to work in um but but ultimately those those end those end goals remain the same the trick is to understand what you know without it wanting to sound saucy what pleasure looks like right because it could be just a, a beautiful clasp that opens in a lovely way or it could mm. be materials that speak to you or it, it could be the provenance of some of the key pieces that you put in or, or or your your kind of relationship with a space that you're in or the ability to strengthen relationships from a room you go in you know the the the, the notion of this is is fascinating to me and when you start to explore what what it is to create you know, pleasurable products, you start to really um, think about things, you know, in the, the kitchen space, which is where I've worked for most of my career um, since, I, since I graduated, you start to think about things differently from, you know, where, where, where does the fridge go, but, but start to change, um, change the priorities and what, what matters. And, and you can, I think your work can end up maybe slightly more remarkable because you're coming at it from a from a from a different angle. I've never heard somebody describing industrial design as putting the pleasure back into products. Is this unique? Uh, unique to you? No. Well, I'd I'd love to claim um, I'd love to claim ownership of it, but it, it like it not at all. So so um, where, when I was doing my master's degree in Loughborough, this is how industrial design was defined to us. So it's how they defined the discipline. Okay, um, I've heard of it as being defined as identifying solutions to everyday problems. Yeah. Um, I like yours better. Thanks. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I think that's one level. I think to, to do my definition, you've got to do your definition. Um, but um, but I think there's probably, there's a richness to it that that doesn't really, that doesn't really kind of do do for me it doesn't really work you know so so i i kind of really yours connects to the human experience t totally and um and you look at it also connects you know it connects chippendale to steve jobs it like there's this this golden thread that lies between you know, like the history of 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 incredible designers and their work um what even is that though, gold thread well, well it's this idea that they're they're completely connected to their user and they have an awareness of what that person needs in that in that moment uh, and it isn't always practical it isn't always just how can this you know how can this chair be better for sitting on you know that's not it it's what what what, what is your what's your take on it then how can this chair be what well, well there's this like i would absolutely i'm not the author of this at all but there's this there's this amazing book that i'd encourage everyone to read called uh, designing pleasurable products by pat jordan and it, it goes through the different kinds of emotional connections people have with their with their products right so so sometimes it might be what your product says about you where you've got to in a certain moment in your life it could be that it you know it's aligned with your values it, it might be that you know if you if you believe very strongly in uh, a small carbon footprint the fact that, that the product was was crafted less than a mile from your house and that's where you have it matters a lot now that doesn't mean it's better at, at being a chair or a matchbox or a, whatever it is it but it, it it has a resonance to the things that matter to you so um so starting to unpick that i f i just i find it habitually fascinating mm. um and it 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 helps us you know one, one of the things we seek to do in at, at lancering is to is to innovate and and to really remain innovating in that in that kitchen space which happens to be the area that that we have our, our kind of core competency in um, so n now we're talking about lancering. So, um, forgive me. Tell, so, lancering are a kitchen. H how do you describe your so, brand? So, we are a um, a luxury kitchen maker and designer. The, um, the world's best. I, well, yeah, I suppose. <laughs> I, I we we were talking about this earlier. I, I I believe it's the world's best, but I'm like horrendously biased. Um, and why, if you why are they the world's best? Well. Um, it, it kind of plays into some of the things I was talking about. Like historically, it's owned by two brothers, Bert and Hannah's Radishitz, and their great great grandfather set up our workshop in rural Austria a hundred years ago. 
to next year, 100 years ago next year. So over, the, over that period of 100 years, Vienna's been a very important city creatively. So the, birth, the creative birth of Bauhaus happened in Vienna, right? The creative birth of Art Deco happened in Vienna. And then various things happened over that period of time and they were exported all over the world. And as a small workshop, we just kind of sat there servicing these incredible designers and architects and learning by osmosis and like all of the all of the incredible work that was going on in at that time was kind of osmotically kind of coming into the the spirit of the business um and that you know modernism with a with a, a capital m and that that international style um it's 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 really really unique and it was it was it was totally groundbreaking at the time so so we were commissioned to create stuff that was aligned with that over that 100 year period there was no marketing we didn't go into mass produ production we've retained craft as a core focus um and in the region where we are us and kind of several other small boutique workshops evolved they're all four or five generations old and there's a school in graz which is 20 minutes from the workshop that takes school leavers and trains them to master's level cabinet makers. Mm -hmm. So all of our recruits that come in have got master's degrees in cabinet making and they become our draftsmen and our designers and our project managers. Half of our staff here in London are Austrian and have been through that, that process. Um, and then Bernd came over to London 20 years ago and founded a brand called Interior ID, which was a, a, a kind of joinery business. And that happened at the same time that um, kind of one Hyde Park was happening and there was a seismic shift in London with interior design uh, and I, I have to say that the work that happened with one Hyde Park really transformed the culture of interior design in How? London well I mean I, I personally found now this may have been because I was um, I was a, a Channel Islander and a peculiar <laughs> little chap when I first moved to London um, that, that it was it was a closed shop for me like I, I didn't feel I was welcome in in the design world um, and I had kind of delusions of grandeur at the time and, and realized that that it just wasn't delusions of grandeur about your abilities yeah I, totally Good. yeah I, I was I was I was overconfident and, and a, like a keen talker I'd say but but actually I was just quite peculiar around the edges um, and that's what that's what uh, living on an island can, can do for you um, and, but it was it was very much a closed shop. And then my observations is 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 you know after the after the candies did what they did, this this proliferation of of merit driven interior design houses have sprung up over the last fifteen years, and and these guys are incredible. And, and it's become a hub, a global hub of talent. And that, that that meritocratic quality makes it a real joy to work in. So so we worked with those guys. Um, through that period, I wasn't with the business at the time. We 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 did some fit out work in 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 One Hyde Park, which was amazing, um, and we we kind of stayed close to to a lot of those 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 designers who have become close friends of the business, and we've we've always worked in that space. And then when Lancering uh, really came about, it's when we started to design our own products as opposed to making for the, for the world's best designers. So that's more when I, I joined the business and um, there were people who, who did some incredible work before me and, th and then I was able to to kind of come in latterly and, and help to kind of push that push that forward a little bit as a, as a business. And um, it happened at the same time as social media. So, so, you know, last quarter we were working in, I think, eight countries with Lancering. So, so our work was recognized. Um, but all of the work we do has this 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 very coherent, crafted, contemporary language to it. So everything's we don't really do traditional furniture in the traditional way, but everything's made by hand, um, and that seems to suit people who love that international style. You know, the kind of the next evolution of modernism rather than minimalism, and that has found an audience globally for for the kind of you know international awesome people. Have you got an award-winning design? Every year we host the Designer Awards, where we celebrate the very best in design and architecture at a swanky venue in London. Find out how to submit your entry for free at designerawardsuk.com. Best of luck. How do your kitchens satisfy this pleasure process that we that's talked about? Good question. That's a good question. Um, I th so that hopefully in lots of ways, um, what I would really hope with one of our products when people get to live with it is that their relationship with it develops over time. So it's not the kind of thing that you just walk into and like or dislike, but 
as you learn more about the thinking that's gone into some of the work and it you, it starts to reveal itself and, and decode itself to you over time you your relationship with it should deepen um we try and str- an intelligent kitchen well, well not smart not, kitchen. not so much that because nothing changes but just as you kind of get to see how much thought's gone into details and how much care's gone into a little moment you that may not be immediately obvious to begin with but when you live with something and you use it every day and you see how thought through it is that's when that all kind of you kind of Hopefully you're thinking, yeah, this really is. Give, give an example. Just um, like a, a great example would be something as simple as a, a draw pull or a junction or a little interface between materials where you, when you walk in and you see everything, it's just one detail of many. And then, you know, you might be having your, your finger under a, a countertop where you might find a little bit of leather in a finger pull detail or something. And then all of a sudden you, you see and then you open it and you want to investigate it and in, inspect it and see how did somebody think of it? How, why did somebody spend all that time putting it there? And only because it's like really awesome. It's really, really lovely for the moment, you know, that, that you use it for the first time. Or if you drop, you know, if you drop your phone and you're on your hands and knees picking it up and you look up and see the underside of the furniture and you realize that's just as beautiful wow. as all of the, the, you know, the things on the top as well. So um, that, that's, a, that's a, a perfect example of where it's, it's special. But, but also... Which um, makes complete sense about your bike because yeah. it is such a beautifully crafted, unique. Yeah, from every angle. Thing that, that, you know, thing. and and it, it so it's not it's it's kind of transcended functionalism, right? It's it's gone beyond that. That's not really why 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 I, why I love it. Um, but it and, makes sense that you put your hands on those beautiful leather crafted yeah. handlebars, your bottom on this beautiful leather seat. Yeah. It, well. Yeah. Yeah. Everywhere you're touching, it feels beautiful. It's a, a tactile and, experience. And, yeah, it's been just kind of thought about. It's, it's complete. Like, like your it, kitchen. It's really complete. And, and I think yeah. that, 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 that matters a lot. Um, Nurturing. Lovely. And, and also things like, you know, and this isn't unique to us, but, but just the, like the, um, the provenance of materials. So, so you know, we, we quite often go with our clients to see quarries in Italy and, and we source slab from block from quarry and seeing that process from mm. you know from from hill to component matters so that you're connected it's not just a bit of you know it's not just a bit of worktop it's a very special piece of stone that you've had a you know you've had a hand in selecting um and also i, I think our design process it gives people a chance to be really heard so as you know it's it, i think it's really hard to buy stuff from us because we don't operate in that traditional way of, of of having a product on show that we're convincing is the right one. I think we start with a blank sheet of paper and then we do drawings with pens and stuff. And um, it's harder because we're, we're trying to innovate and we're trying to capture a brief and understand people's emotional needs from the space mm. and then articulate that through the language of, of, fitted, of fitted furniture, which sounds incredibly pompous. Um, but it, it, it isn't. It's like it's a really intimate. It's a really intimate moment when when these things come together and when when the work's good, it's really good. And sometimes we're just like, you know, we're a bit too overindulgent and it isn't the right thing. But but that's the same with everyone. And, and I, I seeing people then because it's it's very personal, right? When you get to the, the end of a project and you get to meet people in their space, like it's a really it's a really special old thing. It's a really intimate moment. Um, and the, the kitchen is considered the heart of the home. So my next two questions are, how are you innovating then? And how are you meeting clients' emotional needs? So so a, per, a per, perfect example. And again, I, I can't claim authorship of this because I'm like the kitchen industry, in some ways it's quite stagnant. But in other ways, there are some real luminaries in design who have, who have worked in it, who, who I'm, I'm lucky enough to kind of stand on the shoulders of giants because there's some amazing theory and thinking that goes into kind of kitchen design. If you look at how it's evolved, certainly in this country um, over the last 20 years, I, I think it's I think it's, it's amazing. You know, I, I had the pleasure of working with, with, with Mark, Mark Wilkinson, um, as he, with, with some of his product design, which was just like a real honor. Um, and, you know, I, I've met Johnny Gray a couple of times, who was just such a, a an incredible I- innovator. Um, so, so I can't I can't claim ownership of any of this stuff, but but I've been able to kind of bear witness to real geniuses working in in this space. And you know, a, a, a classic a classic point from for, from Johnny actually is 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 where where you should be looking when you're working in a kitchen matters more than than maybe some of the practicalities because if you're looking at where the people who you care about 
in your home are, so dining tables, living areas, you're more likely to have a conversation with them. And if you if you have more conversations with people, you're more likely to have a closer relationship, right? Oh, I so, love so, that. So, so, so how can how can the, the the basic principles of kitchen design contribute to to kind of stronger relationships? Like a super simple way of thinking about it can really it can really transform, um, you know, what a space means to people and and how it influences them. So where you're looking in a kitchen? Yeah, when you're like at the say when you're at the hot, you know, think of Think of Christmas or high days or holidays when you know, you're surrounded by people you love, um, and uh, you're you know you're preparing an amazing meal for them because that's like a kind of a, a statement of how much you care. You don't want to be cloistered away somewhere, excluded from that conversation. Right? It's like because the preparing of the food is as important as you know the eating of it or Lovely. the washing up. So 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 if you if you kind of think about those moments and those little scenarios about what what you want from this space you're able to to nudge people in different directions mm. so that the space is working in a different way and i just think that's i think that's awesome right that, and that's not even about you know the fact you know at, at lansering we, we make some of our own hinges so there's a real beautiful moment there but but these kind of broader principles are much more humanist and much more focused on you know how can we how can we kind of be happier in our ho- in our homes with our with our families and that 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 matters and that seems to matter across the wealth spectrum as well that's not a function of 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 your lifestyle everybody wants to have like richer relationships with people they really care about Mm. it's 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 a universal principle that we we've noticed and and identified it like across the across the spectrum of, of of the work we've done another um thing that's becoming increasingly popular is um creating a kitchen space that is multifunctional so almost seamlessly becomes from kitchen to entertaining space yeah yeah i, I mean i i think that's um i think that's great right because because we do kitchens <laughs> so the, the more of that the better from a purely commercial mm. angle but but ultimately you know the way people consume media is different so so you used to have a room with all the furniture pointed at a tv and i just i just don't think people live like that anymore they've got phones or tablets or or, or ipads or, or or whatever people are in some ways more more kind of disparate you know you don't really have people don't come together on a sunday night to watch antiques roadshow and last of the summer wine um mm. it just it, like it just doesn't it doesn't it doesn't happen so so then so what what kind of what is entertainment when you're in a space with your loved ones and ultimately it's it's probably each other it's probably got some eating um you know so so it, like it completely makes sense that that's your entertainment space because that is your <laughs> that's kind of your entertainment as well i saw this amazing um apartment in dubai that was featured in harper's bazaar and the kitchen space was concealed underneath these beautiful worktops that then revealed underneath popped up the kitchen yeah the functional aspects of the kitchen like the sink and the cooker yeah, and yeah anything else well i mean so i I think that's amazing, that kind of Bond yeah. style, you know, um, surprise and delight and all this stuff appearing from nowhere. But You've got a beautiful way with words. Just, uh, thank you. That's kind. I'm not sure that's true. I'd like to think I do, but it's, I'm not sure it's true. But but um, but what about you kind of explore? A lot of our work has much more kind of a, an analog quality to it. So How so? so? So it may be that we've spent a lot of time creating a beautifully tactile surface, or it might be the interface of a of a drawer with a you know a brass finger pull and a, a, a little bit of stone and, and the way it might is around a drawer mm. that's where the majesty is it's not in the big reveal it lies in in the craft rather than the kind of the, the broad brush you know press a button and um you know there's a there's a cafe latte waiting for you 70 yards away um you know it's it's much more about a connection with 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 the product and People seem to seem to, to to love the tangibility of that, and and the fact that, that that the material has been through hands, and the products support schools that support craft, and and then the the traces and the marks of craft lie on the furniture. They they kind of it, it tells the story of how it came to be mm. through 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 the the tactility of it and it's it's like a very different experience to to that that big reveal which is also awesome and like it's amazing but but our work is is very different it's much more 
you know, like, it, yeah, it's just much more tactile. Mm. And I'm curious about the um, the buying process for your clients. Yeah. Um, it, it, it is finance at the, the f- forefront of their decision making or, or are they more concerned with provenance of products? Yeah, I, I, I think that's... Sustainability. I mean, the, how are people deciding how to buy? That's, I think, I think... I think that's a good question. So I think we're I think we're niche. Um, I think that's probably fair to say. Um, and quite often people will come to us because they can't get what they want anywhere else um, because of the unique kind of craft capability we have from this Austrian heritage. Uh, we're always the nature of the work we do. We always have a creative team. So there's always an architect. There's always an interior designer. There's always a main contract. You know, these guys are these these guys are all involved in the process. So quite often it, it might start with a grand vision from an interior designer um, and c- when you look at the like the incredible work of interior design that the, the interior designers do it often starts with a, a, a series of emotions or a series of look and feel document that they're trying to create so that may be a starting point for us um, and then we're able to come in and bring some value I would hope both at the design stage and then the delivery and the execution stage as well mm. um, so it's much much more about this is the house the house has a certain set of architectural needs you know there are there are key points we have to hit who can we go to that that um that that's capable of delivering that kind of thing and we we generally when we speak to clients we've made it onto a list because they like our stuff they've seen our stuff and it's in line with what they're hoping to achieve and then with with the kind of the the advent of uh you know, I suppose self-publishing a way in that we've been able to show our work on so- social. Um, we've then attracted kind of people globally who've just seen it and recognised it's a little bit different, and then um, they've kind of just come in to make, make inquiries. So, uh, we, it, it, it's not financial, I would say. The the, the driver, it's it, it, it's it's a series of desires based on us being able to do really unique stuff. Mm. have you read this month's issue of designer magazine yet available in digital and print editions designer magazine keeps you updated on the world of design and architecture get your free trade subscription today at designerarty.co.uk We, we talked briefly about you having an awareness about what you value. Yeah. And I think that's very evident that you bring that into your business. Thank you. And and, and, and uh, why is it important to know what you value and how does how commercially is it of any benefit to your business? Um, so I suppose from, from, from my perspective, you know, after I did my master's degree, I was lucky enough to, to work for only six months in... Uh, interior of yacht design which was my my kind of dream job when I was 24 Um, and I actually had a really bad experience there and I I was I ended up with very poor mental health I was I was bed bound with anxiety for two months and um, I dare say it was a function of a lot of things but as I kind of fought my way out of that um, I kind of realized how important good mental health is to kind of everything and it's become a tenement of the culture of the business that we're in. I've, I've had a chance to, to shape the culture a little bit where we are at the moment. And without without good mental health, I just don't think, I don't think you have anything. And what we do as designers and deliverers is it's quite stressful. It can be quite intense. And How so? Well, you have amazing clients. You have really tough deadlines. Every project, we have a lot of contractual needs to hit timelines, deadlines, you know, um, and things go wrong because we're, it's experimental. So we're trying very hard to do new, amazing work. Um, so, so that's stressful. You know, it requires a lot from the team. And if if there's not more, more than an awareness, but 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 like an active effort to ensure people are coping and that their their kind of mental health is under control, I, I just think that that you end up with um, you end up burning people out and you know that's a terrible thing um but having been through that process myself i think you're able 
I think it's a it's a superpower having lived with it. So so anxiety never really goes away, but I think if you can get it under control, it can give you you can turn it positive and it can be enthusiasm. Um, and I, I, ult- I think that they're, they're both two sides of the same coin, but also you're able to, to empathize very strongly. I think when people are maybe having a tough day or where it's a bit more serious and they're in a situation where, where clients aren't, um, you know, or the client team isn't necessarily pl- playing fair given uh, you know, a lot of effort for, 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 from, from the team. And you just need to know that you're you know the enemies are outside the gate, right? The the, the team itself mm-hmm. is super strong. You, you, we've got each other's backs. We're not trying to, um, you know, we're not trying to wear people out and, and discard them, mm-hmm. but actually, really, really, you're co-creating. Yeah, but also nurturing humans just in a work environment. It's it's so super important, and I think never has that been more evident than through periods like the pandemic, where, um, you know, I just think it was the perfect breeding ground for poor mental health. And and um, I'm not I'm not saying we as individuals or, or as a team didn't have challenges there because I think everybody did. But ultimately, the fact that we referenced it and we talked about it openly um, and that it was on the agenda mattered. Um, and some members of my team, who I'm incredibly proud of, have have spoken publicly in the group about their challenges in the past and at the, in the present. And it's it's I would hope created an environment where people can. A, be really honest about their challenges, but 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 also be that they're able to thrive more completely as 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 people and as as professionals. Lovely, with an awareness of 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 the of the effect that a poor mental health can have to your well being, and also a positive mental health can have to your well being. Are there any tips and tricks that you've managed to incorporate into your life to maintain your your mental well being where you want it to be? Um, yeah, I think, um, well, cycling is like the key, <laughs> the key one. So I, I was, I, I had, I had counseling after this, this incident. And one of the, one of the findings was that, that actually exercise is incredibly powerful for kind of keeping you in, in kind of good shape. So, um, so I've, I've always cycled since then, which is why my bike's so important to me. It's not, it's not just about a vehicle, right? But it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a tool for tackling myself. Um, so, so cycling's massively, you know, massively important. Um, and you know, I've got, I've, I've kind of got a, 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 a toolkit of tools for, for tackling these things. I think it's really important to, to kind of write lists, to, to be super organized, to be really disciplined, to find, to find the, the kind of the, the, the sincere silliness in, in like just moments and, and find a way to, to la- laugh about things right in the heat of the moment. Um, and and I just think it, you're able to deconstruct what could be very stressful situations with with without without it's not that you're not taking them seriously because you are but you're also just kind of you know piercing the the bubble of um, of of just that that hyper stress that just can take people to, to tough places but also it's it, like it's very different for different people this is just you know this is a personal set of tools I've sought to develop to tackle my own peculiar habits and and I just think people have to. <laughs> get a bit older, understand themselves and, and figure out the right coping strategies for, 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 for them, re- regardless of, of what it is that they, they find difficult. But also it sounds quite it sounds quite bizarre, isn't it? But people really do need to understand that we are not just something that is a robotic instrument to execute our you know daily life. We actually have a set of values, a set of needs, a set of feelings, yeah. that, a set of thoughts that need to be cared for on a daily basis, as well as our to-do list. Well, well, well uh, you know, absolutely. And especially, I- ironically, you know, looking at it through, like I've always been on the on the creative side, like you, you, emotion becomes a currency. You have to be aligned with it because you're using it a lot of the time to help understand and develop hopefully really lovely work. So you, you can't just block it off you have to kind of be at one with it but also weirdly when you're in the technical space where, where we see maybe people are really challenged because they don't have an outlet everything's very regimented and rigorous Th- those seem to be the times when you, you, you still need a way of a release valve and um mm. you know a means of regenerating and, and finding finding like a bit of personal renewal however that is or whatever it looks like and um you know I, I'm not an expert on this right at all, but I, I'm probably an expert on myself because I've I've had to live with myself for quite a while. <laughs> um, and I think that I just think it should be talked about more. Mm. I think it really should be in open parlance, in professional environments, 
much, much more. So people are able to find the tools they need for being awesome, really. What, what, what will, what's your next project, your next, what's on your vision board? Um, so we've just opened an office in New York. Um, we opened last September and um, a lot of the work came from uh, America when we first when we first hit social media. So we recognized there was a demand for our work. And, and a lot of my time and, and Burnt's time, especially who, who, who owns the business has been spent um, building the brand and the, our kind of proposition to a, a new market. So that that's taking up a huge amount of time and it's really gratifying. It's a really special place, the showroom we're really proud of. And, and you know, New York is, is just a, a crazy city. So it's lovely to be there. Are you finding um, culturally any differences, any any requirements and changes in style, aesthetics? Um, aesthetics, not so much, but I would say um, you learn an awful lot more about yourself when you try and operate in a new culture. How so? Just things you take for granted or um, priorities, what you think matters, sense of humor. These are all things that um, it's easy to misjudge cultural cues in a new place. And the only answer is just do it more, right? Just spend more time in there and understand, you know, the, the minutiae of communication and not think you're right. Um, I think those are the kind of, those are our key learnings from the time we spent there so far. Mm, interesting, yeah, yeah. I've noticed in America when you walk in a shop, they say, have a, have a nice day. Yeah, people are really cheerful. Um, and they talk to you, which, you know, as a person who's lived in London for many years. I love that. I'm, I always think I'm being slightly attacked when people interesting. talk to me. Interesting. Isn't that interesting? And over here, people call me patronizing. Oh, really? Yeah, when I say, have a nice day. Yeah. Oh, in America, they'd love that. Why patronize me? Yeah, yeah. No, no, I'm really not. I really want you to have a nice day. Yeah. So it's interesting. Okay, cultural differences. You're fascinating. We haven't even talked about, you know, you worked with the Lindley brand. You were very yeah. senior, senior director there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's another luxury brand. Yeah, it was. I mean, a very different vision of luxury. and like British. Massively British. Like a huge honour. Um, probably one of the biggest honours of my career to be able to, to represent that brand for... for, for, for Why? Well, well, I mean, D David is iconic as yeah. a human being, like an incredible, an incredible character. I think he's done an awful lot for our sector and to put luxury furniture making and um, design on the map in London and more globally. Um, and to be able to represent that was a, it was a, it was a, it was a, a huge moment for me. Um, I mean, your clients, Elton John, Oprah Winfrey. I couldn't possibly talk about my clients uh, at Lindley. <laughs> I, w I wouldn't dream of doing that. But 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 I can I I can, I can talk about you know the, the incredible experiences we had there. I mean it was it was just incredible and it, like a, a privilege. How to be so? A part the of access. It. Well, well, not not so much that, but the the nature of the work. So it's like a the, the nature of the work. Kind of Dave created a new world where people could think and identify and design and work on products that like we just not seen since you know since since victorian times in terms of the amount of work that went into key products like it, it just it just evaporated and he he bought that back really and and um it, it has a place you know in the in the kind of continuum the, the story of 20th century 21st century design it, it it like it has a it has a place and to be able to contribute in as as, as big or little way as, as as i did to to that to that business means an awful lot to me mm. um and i think i think my mum told a lot of people as well i think she was very proud um so that was quite good mm. <laughs> yeah you well you're a visionary you're an artisan and you are a, a purveyor of luxury and I'm grateful. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time today, Alex. It's been our pleasure. If you've enjoyed today's podcast, like and subscribe. I'm going to be here every Monday morning with more exciting guests. See you then.